We got a ton of FanDuel tickets this weekend from the playoff games and Saturday night from the Lakers-Warriors game that went that to double overtime. Game. LeBron won. We're going to talk Phenomenal. about that in overtime. Ton of uh, FanDuel winning tickets, and we're going to showcase them throughout the week. We have more than we can showcase in five days, so we'll get to all those, I promise. But we'll start with this one today. But, guys, it is Super Bowl week, and happy Super Bowl Two weeks now for everyone who celebrates from FanDuel America's number one sports book. If you're like me and Jason and the other guys on this panel, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite football snacks, and placing some super bets. And you know what the best place to place a Super Bowl bet is? It's FanDuel. It's obvious. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three or four, five, or six if you're like us. Not only can you bet on the Super Bowl and who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. And new customers, if they join today, get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Win a $5 bet. Get $200 in bonus bets. So visit FanDuel.com slash UCSF to sign up. FanDuel.com slash UCSS. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. And today's winning ticket comes from Willie Moe, who turned $10 into $238 with a 11-part same-game parlay in that Lakers-Warriors double overtime thriller. He hit the over points for a bunch of players, over threes, over LeBron assists, <laughs> over Clay Thompson points, over Draymond Green assists, among others. But $10, $10 into $236.62. Shout out to Willie Moe. We got plenty more tickets coming up throughout the rest of the week. Always nice when uh, games go to overtime when you bet the over on everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You bet. it's like free. It's, it's really yeah. you know those bonus minutes make all the difference in the world. If you take the under and it's borderline, you're, mm, you're biting done. your fingernails. I got smoked yesterday. What'd you bet? Damn. I got I got hit. Would you have Lions money line? No, no, no. Lamar. I had Lamar Jackson. Oh, he was bad. Under he was bad, but he was good with the stats. Under 281 and a half uh, total yards between rushing and yeah. passing. This dude just comes out second half, like 50 yards the first half. He comes out, sees Zay Flowers, he throws the ball. Next thing you know, all of them are green. It's the worst mm. feeling in the world. So you see that red, it's like, mm. yeah. how about did Rose Bush do? Oh, she took an L too. She took the L. <laughs> she took it. She took that L. Is she is she loving or she, hating this game? She, she, oh, yeah. she's finished. Yeah, she's, she's, done. she's locked all the accounts too. I said, just because you mad, don't lock my account. <laughs> <laughs> you took the L. That we're not together in this L. Like you know, I'm comfortable with my L. You are. <laughs> That's great. Let's dive into our first topic here. The Browns have made an offensive coordinator hire. Ken Dorsey will be teaming up with. Kevin Stefanski, Tommy Reese, and the rest of the Browns offensive coaches as their new offensive coordinator. Guys, we'll talk about play calling in a sec, but let's start with the hire sure itself. Off. What would you grade <laughs> just beat. the hire, the Cleveland Browns hire of Ken Dorsey? I, I, I mean, a grade, I, I'm okay with the hire. The more I look into it, the more I'm okay with it. I'll say it's a B. Well, I, how are you with the knock on him that this guy was fired and the team that he was OC for – Got better after he left okay. the Bills. I, 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 That's the big knock. I was me. one of the people that said that. Yeah. I was one of the people without doing, like, I just said, hey, the Bills were better. But here's the thing. If you look at it, the difference in the games with Dorothy, Dorsey, and you look at some of the stats, they were actually better with Ken Dorsey. The biggest difference, of course, is they won more in those last few games and they scored more points even though they got actually more points per drive. The difference was Josh Allen stopped turning the ball over. And I think what happened was, in the end, Ken Dorsey took the hit for Josh Allen. I think so, too. Josh Allen was in a slump from, like, week five to week ten, whatever it was. You know, there was a stretch of games, six weeks, where he was turning the ball. He's always been a big turnover guy, but he makes up with it with a ton of touchdowns. Sure. But he was particularly struggling in this stretch. And Kent Dorsey took the, the brunt of the blame for it. I think if you look overall, he's done a good – he spent most of his professional career as a coach, as a quarterback coach, <laughs> with Cam Newton and Josh Allen. What do those guys have in common with Deshaun Watson? All three are excellent athletes yeah. and use their legs. Now, Deshaun Watson's not built like Cam Newton and Josh Allen, but he has the same type of game as those guys. He likes to run. He likes to run. That's yeah. a big part of it. It's a big part of Josh Allen's game. It was a big part of Cam Newton's game. The Bills defense under Ken Dorsey in 2022 was excellent. They were really good. And even with some of the struggles, it wasn't like they were terrible offensively. 
Uh, they committed more to the run later, and they had success with it with, uh, what's his name, uh, Brady. But they also, I thought, in my opinion, ran too much against the Chiefs, so who knows. I think it's a, it's a perfectly fine hire. We'll get, into, obviously, into the, the play calling of it, but I'm perfectly fine with it. Okay, BB minus. Jay, you like it? It feels underwhelming to me. I, I don't know if I can put a grade on it right now. I think he's a name guy, though. Right? He's I mean, a name. So we didn't have to look up and see who he is. No, he no, he's from. definitely a name guy. He's I mean, he name. won a national championship in college. Sure. He played now here. his quarterback play here. We were looking for video from him last week when he was in for the interview. And our editor was digging deep in the archives mm. when he was a quarterback here. All he could find were his picks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, how many touchdowns did he throw here? None. Not that we had. Oh. I mean, if he did, our, our local shooters didn't archive them. Well, but. I, I, I poked around. Eight uh, touchdowns, 18 interceptions in his career. We, saw, we found a lot of interceptions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I poked around in Buffalo about, like, what happened? How did he get the job? Where did it all go wrong? That sort of thing. And yeah. I know we're going to get to the play calling in a minute. I think it's curious to me. He never called a play before he got to Buffalo at any level on any team. Which is shocking. Yeah. I so, was surprised to find that out, too. So he's got a year and a half experience as a play caller, and that's yeah. it. And we'll get to the rest of that later. But basically, I mean, this is Josh Allen's guy. Josh picked him. And Brian Dayball was the offensive coordinator, left to go to the Giants, took the, one of the assistants with him. Shea Tierney went with him. And, jo- and, and the Bills basically said, and one thing that I didn't really line up the timelines, I was told was this was going on right when Aaron Rodgers was complaining in Green Bay about not having any say in uh, any sort of decision making. And the Bills basically wanted to make Josh happy. Mm-hmm. And they said, who do you want? And Josh loved Ken Dorsey right. and and Ken was on the field Dayball was in the booth Ken was on the field with them and and they developed a rapport and and Josh really liked him and that was his guy and in terms of like where it all went wrong or how it all unraveled in, in this year and everything else Josh apparently went through some personal things toward the end of last season into the postseason and it carried off in, in through the summer and combined with that there was sort of a mandate from above Ken Dorsey of trying to make him more of a pocket passer. The Bills wanted to protect Josh. They didn't want him running as much. Ooh, they stupid. wanted to just sort of restrain him for fear of injury and whatever else. That wasn't else. Ken's idea. Those were his That was not orders. Ken's idea. Yeah, that I think was, that's a bad plan. And that was his, that's what, that's what the Bills decided as an organization. They determined that that's what they wanted to do. To keep they, him healthy. They wanted to try and, and limit some of his <clears throat> exposure to injuries and runs and everything else. Yeah. And when they fired Ken. It was really the way it was explained to me was it was sort of, and this is this this part's true. This happens a lot when teams fire guys. It sort of was like a jolt to the to the locker room. And a lot of times you'll see a guy get fired, like a ba- a baseball team will fire a hitting coach. Yeah. And it's just to get guys' attention, and maybe it's a pressure release valve to to let some of the pressure out of the room. And guys, when Ken was fired, guys kind of looked around like, man, we got to get this. We got to get this together. So like, that was their wake up call. And it, it really did sort of serve as a wake up call yeah. when Ken was fired. And it, and, and it really sort of jolted guys. And then they sort of took the shackles off of Josh a little bit. He started playing a little bit more freer uh, toward the second half of the season after they were five and five. I mentioned briefly there was that article that came out uh, that really was devastating to Sean McDermott. And it really sort of rallied the locker room. So there was a lot of things at play here. I'm still not overly, I'm not blown away by the hire. I do think that they were probably waiting on, uh, uh, who was the other guy? I just Kellen felt, Moore. Thank Kellen you. Moore. Kellen Moore. I think they're probably waiting to see what Kellen Moore decided. See, did, were, you, were you hearing anything about Kellen no. Moore? Because I was hearing kicking the tires and that's it. No one thought he the was time, the The only reason I mentioned it is because the timing was curious. Sure. That Kellen goes first and then Josh go, and then they, they go. What I heard even before Kellen came in was that this isn't, you know, they're interested. Checking you know, the box. They're, 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 they're kicking the tires on yeah. it, but it wasn't their guy. So I'm thinking that it was probably Dorsey all along. It was Dorsey Maybe along. they were just doing their due diligence yeah. and felt he's a name, he's available, let's yeah. talk to him. But from what I was hearing was it, it felt like it, this job wasn't his. There are some stark differences in how Ken Dorsey calls a game and how Kevin Stefanski calls a game. And we'll get into that in a little Do bit. Do you want to characterize them briefly? Is he more of a risk taker? Is no, he, he's the exact opposite. He's, so he's less a risk yes. taker. than well, That's interesting. Yes, very that's much That's very so. Well, but they threw the ball a lot with him. We'll talk about it. Okay. okay. Gee, but what grade do you give it ultimately? B, but Bull was it's a B so minus. hard. It's so hard to do yeah, grades. It I feels know. like draft day grades. I know. We're just doing it to do it. I mean, we're not going to hold. I'll you call to it. it. A, I'll call it a C. Okay. A nice average, solid C. Right. 
G? Well, um, you know, I, I'm going to give you my grade first, and I'll explain why. I think this is a C higher, but as a way, it, it has um, the potential to get to a B plus. Um, the reason I like to hire is I like people that are motivated. And one of the best motivators are when you get let go. Or when Especially pe- mid-season. Yeah, mid-season. When, you know, th- th- that doesn't happen. When they let you go mid-season as a coach, that really means that you are, I'm not going to say cancer or anything like that, but you, we feel like you are holding us back so much that we need to cut bait and move in a different direction and pivot, not seeing this thing through. So when you look at Dorsey and he gets let go, um, he probably feels that he was let go unjustly. He probably feels that he took a lot of L's for other people and he was a scapegoat, kind of like Van Pelt thinks he's a scapegoat. The problem is now he gets to here to Cleveland and now you have another guy in Deshaun Watson. We'll probably get to this as well. Deshaun Watson feels like he is uh, under a lot of pressure and he is a guy that has a target on his back. And the most dangerous person uh, in the world are, are people who feel like they have axes to grind and their backs against the wall. Um, I think Kevin Stefanski, to a certain extent, feels like that because we got to even come in here and hire another guy. We talking about he ain't got an extension. He don't have any of that. And a lot of people can sit here and say, oh, it's no big deal. No big deal. No, no one's no one's mad. No one's upset. BS. Yeah, I got to keep it real. These are human beings. Let you go into. Hey, watch this. Everybody that had this happen before. It's a Friday. <laughs> Your boss calls you at 345 and says, hey, um, I, I want, could you get here a little earlier on Monday? I, I want to, um, I, I, we, we have, a, have to have, have a meeting one-on-one about something. And you like, you going to call me 345 on a Friday. Let this boy linger all weekend. So I got to think about, well, what do you want? What the heck is going on? I didn't get written up. What did I do? So when, when you are a human being and, you, and you're sitting here and they're telling you we're making changes, they make changes not because you're good. They made a change because they feel you're not good enough. So, Here's my thing. I want all of them to be in the room feeling like it ain't good enough. I would want nothing more than them to come out and Dorsey says, listen, I'm going to show you I could, I, I do what I can really do. I was held back. I want Deshaun Watson to say, let me show you about this. Listen, this is this is the type of offense I want. I'm going to take control of the man on this is how I'm going to move. And I want to see, say, Stefanski can come in and say, you guys thought I was just talking about plays and I was a one-trick pony. You know, let me show you I'm actually a, a coach of men. So guess what? We, we could work with the play caller, but I'm more than just calling plays. So I like to hire because <laughs> I want people being motivated coming in this year. I, ha- I have a hard time giving it a grade, and here's why. I don't know what he's going to do. Yep. What, what was he brought here for? Is he going to be an AVP where he's going to have the job in title only but no authority? If so, I don't need to give it a grade. I don't think he'll have much impact at all. But I am increasingly of the mindset that that's not what's going on here. Mm-hmm. I believe Ken Dorsey was brought here to call plays. hmm And I believe in the not too distant future, that's going to happen. Could be wrong. No one's told me that. Mm -hmm. It's totally, in fact, I've heard the opposite. I've heard that Kevin is not giving up play calling and he will call plays. I truly hope that's the case. But to me, all of this feels like, because there wasn't a definitive stamp of approval from Andrew Barry that, oh, he is our play caller. He will continue calling plays. The organization is fine Mm -hmm. with that. He did not get that. Well, Kev, Andrew did say he thought one of Kevin's greatest strengths was play calling. Sure. They say a lot of things. I know. But I just around the truth. I know. But I just want to get and that on the record. I, that he did say that. And he also said, we love, when I asked about the extension, we love Kevin. Yeah. Never said, of course he's getting an extension. So perhaps they wanted to see what his reaction was when they brought in a guy that's called plays at the NFL level. And they decide to tell Kevin he's going to call plays. How does Kevin take that? And again, I don't have any information that that's going to happen. It's my gut. I just feel in my gut that at the end of this season, when those three coaches were boom, 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 out, it told me, oh, Jimmy is not happy with this offense. He's not. Now, look, if you bought a quarterback for $230 million and this is what you've gotten, I wouldn't be happy with it either. He has every right to not be happy with it particularly when Jimmy has seen the offense look really, really good without Deshaun Watson. It's also looked very bad without Deshaun Watson. But I'm just, knowing Jimmy Haslam and his history and his track record, 
this feels like that's where we're going. Jay, I, I agree with most of what you said. There's just one thing I take issue with. Okay. I don't believe that even if he's not calling plays and his job, it's all, you're making it seem like his job doesn't really matter. No, I just don't know the impact he can have. I, and and I don't either. I don't know what the impact his is. His jobs I don't, matter or no one would be yeah, in Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think the offensive coordinator, obviously, if the offensive coordinator is calling plays, which we'll get into, he has more of an impact on the team on that player, obviously. S- not just more substantially but I I don't know if it's substantially more because I I think the whole we just see the game right sure but leading up to that game is an entire week an entire year of preparation it is and I would assume I don't know I'm not in the locker room that the offensive coordinator even if he's not a play caller is very much involved with that plan I think that's a safe assumption bull and, and I think that's what it was last year with AVP but here's ultimately it's all about show me the baby. I don't want to hear about the labor. And and that's last year we had the discussion about the Sean Watson. What, is he doing enough? You know, and then we saw some workout videos suddenly come up. And to answer the critics that might say, you know, he's not doing enough. And at the time I said, I don't really care. I don't need to see that he's working out. I don't need to hear that he's working out. We'll know when we see him. We'll, when we see him, we'll know. And I always say the same thing with the, however they get to a offense that is reminiscent of the Buffalo Bills. I don't even care how they get there. I think don't, don't you guys when you talked about alignment don't to me like as just being around the game. I feel like having an offensive coordinator that does not call plays is slightly backwards. I just feel like that is not the alignment that that makes sense. It's almost like saying the, the general manager is beholden to the head coach. It just it just doesn't seem like it's just the, I agree. the correct I, I, top In most down. instances, and I, in yeah. Andy Reid's case, I don't. Yeah, I yeah. think we feel that way because that's the way it was always done in the past. Well, but well, prior to that, the quarterbacks called plays. Imagine those days. Imagine right. those I mean, both days. Both Super Bowl teams the have coaches cor- that call plays. What's that? Both teams in the Super Bowl have coaches that call plays. Well, I know they do, but you can also say, you can also look back in time and say, there is a strong case to be made for, I like your hierarchy too. The head coach is the CEO. He's involved in not just one or the other. I, I almost feel like, and I'm sure this isn't the case, but I feel like because Kevin Stefanski is so immersed in the offense, what's his impact on the defense? And, and we're okay there saying, well, Jim Schwartz is the defensive head coach. Well, if that's the case and you're going to do that on defense, it's just as important on offense. And I think to your point of alignment, I do think that, and I hope this was the way it happened, that the biggest thing that they were looking for were areas of agreement in philosophical yeah. tent poles between Kevin Stefanski and whomever they hire. Sure, but getting back, to, just to get back to that point for a second, you know, we are all stuck in our ways to some degree. There's, thing, there's things that have always been done in a certain way, so we're conditioned to believe, well, that's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. I know, I know, I know this is a, like for fantasy football, I've been using the same website for years. Right. And I don't even, like a, a buddy of mine said, to me, why don't you switch to this new site? It's much better. I'm like, well, I've always been using this website. Sure. So I don't want to change. creatures of habit. Right. And, and that's the same thing. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're older, like we all are on this panel, different va- variations, but none of us are young. So we Speak may think. Speak for yourself. We may think, <laughs> well, it's always been that way, right? The, sure. Or always. But. First, it was co- quarterback. I remember the days when quarterback sure, called plays. Sure, but then for years, you never had the head coach calling plays, and so that's what we all grew up with, right. or mostly. But, I, but I, nowadays, it's commonplace. I could, I'm not, I, that doesn't mean it's definitely right, but I, it works for a lot of guys I that could, have success. I could, I could argue it's happened a lot here. So I believe Chud called the plays, right? I don't remember. I believe Pat Shermer called the plays. You know, that those years <laughs> in my brain, uh, if you looked at it, you know how digital uh, – images come up as ones or zeros, yeah. that is a big dash to, in my brain. That whole era. I don't remember anything about it because I chose not to. Hugh Jackson called plays? Until they uh, took it away from him. Yeah, and then they gave it, and then you see how that happened. And then uh, Freddie Kitchens called Freddie plays. definitely called So plays. there's like four or five in our history. Where we're well, Marty that. Schottenheimer, you go back but, to Marty Schottenheimer, was fired because he right. didn't hire an offensive coordinator. But I believe the in the Super Bowl, now three years in a row, both head coaches have called plays. Bull, I think Sirianni it's the, didn't uh, call plays last year. What's Shane Steichen did. Yes, Steichen called plays. Didn't call oh, plays that's right. Sirianni did not. So but, five but out of six. I, I am agreeing with you that that yeah. is the norm. I totally right. agree with that. 
However, yeah. I also think that three minds are better than one. And and I did and I probably should backpedal a little bit on that harsh comment at the beginning that what difference does it make? I don't mean what difference does it make? That's not really what I mean. We just watched a season in which the guy who didn't call plays got fired. Hard for me to connect those wires. Really hard for yeah, me that, to connect that's those where the, wires. That's where the disconnect comes from because if I'm a guy that is now trying to uh, go into the locker room or go into the staff and I'm saying, well, the last guy got fired for not calling plays. Am I calling the plays or no? Because, what do you mean he got fired for not calling plays? Well, well he, not he, for that. Not he got for that. Fired. He, got, he got fired and he didn't call plays, right? right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it, for me, it's kind of harsh to go that you're an offensive coordinator. You've got to go all the way down the pecking order. You say, wow, well, none of those guys that I fired. The least common denominator was the, the, the guy who was just hanging out, looks like. But he wasn't. But again, it's, he's not just hanging out. You know that. The guy's not. It's not like he's doing nothing all week. No, I know. But in the case of Ken Dorsey. Yeah. The general manager and perhaps the owner and the, and the head coach all got together and said, is he calling the game we need to call to win? And ultimately, the decision was no, he's not. And they did make some changes. I thought they got much more run heavy. And I thought they looked like a team that was more balanced and they had more success for sure. But they ultimately didn't get to where they wanted to go. They lost a home playoff game that wasn't even in the conference championship round. So if you're going to put the season... It, 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 was the Bills season a success or fail? It was a fail. They, they had bigger expectations. They had higher aspirations than just hosting a playoff game and losing at home. And so for yeah. me, I, I think that I, I, I do like the idea that they have another. I, I, I think he's a good offensive mind. I really do. And those that I've talked to said the same thing. He's going to have some different concepts he's going to introduce to the Browns. That's going to